to those who were here before us and to recognize our responsibility as guests to respect and honor the intimate relationship Indigenous peoples have to this land. On behalf of the Population Health Research Institute, Hamilton Health Sciences, McMaster University, and the Vishnu Mandir, thank you for joining us this evening, uh, an, evening of, of, of an evening for this town hall where we will share knowledge and converse on topics of interest regarding COVID-19 vaccines. My name is Sajani Kandasamy, and I, along with Jania Limbachia, will be the co-moderators for this evening's event. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dubey to present opening remarks. Dr. Dubey is a heart surgeon, leader, visionary, mentor, teacher, and philanthropist. He provides spiritual guidance to the peoples of East Asian descent across Canada. He is the founder of the Vishnu Mandir, and through his vision and leadership, has also helped to set up many groups dedicated to serving the South Asian community of Greater Toronto Area, its neighboring communities, and various international aid organizations and landmarks. Please welcome Dr. Dubey. Dr. Dubey, you're on mute. Hello. So yes. thank you again for that kind of introduction. The Honorable Minister, uh, Professor Sonia Anand and the rest of the, the crew. I, it's an honor for me to speak on this occasion. I would like to speak on the topic of the uh, COVID as affects South Asian. First of all, before I start my remarks, I would like to thank the minister for all the vaccines that she is, has provided for all of us. That I think we are, we have more vaccines than many other countries per capita are giving more vaccines per capita than any other country around this, these parts. So Minister, I'd like to thank you very much for that. With regard to the South Asians, South Asians are very, some South Asians are still hesitant in taking the vaccines. Uh, we did give uh, vaccines at the temple uh, two weeks ago. Some of the South Asians who we call and they're over 60, et cetera, and, but especially the younger ones. They are the ones who are querying the efficacy of the vaccine, that's number one. Number two, uh, you're just uh, newly married uh, young women, you, you all probably know all of this already, are questioning whether the vaccine will uh, allow, affect the pregnancy if they get pregnant or affect the child. So, this is something I hope that we will bring out into tonight, tonight's uh, uh, town hall. Also, what is important is that we want to, the South, we, there's no ethnicity uh, part in the, in the inoculation of, the, of people in this country. We have a large South, Indian, South Asian population. We have large Chinese population. We have large black populations, of course, and white. And I would, I would hope that you will throw some light on how we can develop uh, to, see, uh, to see how our South Asians respond to the vaccine. Are they getting, are they getting sicker with the vaccines or not? This is, this is another reason why many South Asians do not want to take a vaccine because they hear that when they, when they get the vaccine, they can get COVID and they can't recover from the, from the COVID. This is not very well explained to Although it has been explained on television and the, your doctor there who comes to television, he explains it also, yet people do not get it. So I would like to say, uh, Professor Sardar, if we can get to the temples, to the mosques, to the gurdwaras, and let people know about this at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a lower level, not only high floating antibodies and, that, and so forth, St straightforward, like what Sonia Anand always talked about the Canadian Tire, for example, analogous to that, we should let people, we should let people know uh, how the vaccine affects them or does that, that's one. Two, having uh, researched the uh, antibodies response in South Asia, which is very important. And I appeal to every one of us to get South Asians to come to this research when we start it, or if it has started, I do not know yet, to enroll in it so we can get some good uh, scientific data about the vaccines as it affects South Asian, the antibodies, the hesitancy, and also 
to let people know that without this vaccine, we are exposing ourselves to a lot of danger. Lots of young people are still very hesitant. One other thing, it is said, I just recently, that if you get two different vaccines, this is a question that is asked a lot, the antibody response is greater. Even this afternoon, just on television, there was, they, 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 they said they don't have any firm data, they have some data, some soft data to say that if you get a Moderna and a, a, or an mRNA vaccine plus some other vaccine, your response is, is better. If this is so, are we doing the right thing? So I think I would like to sum up by saying that we should do this research among South Asians, measure the antibodies, antibody response, see how sick they are, because South Asians, in, in, as far as I know, I do have no scientific data for this, are sicker with COVID than others. So I'd like to turn it over to the panel, unless there are any questions that you'd like to ask me. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dubé. That was very inspirational. So next up, we're pleased and very honored to have with us the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, the Honorable Anida Anand. Uh, Minister Anand was first elected as the Member of Parliament for Oakville in 2019. She's a scholar, lawyer, researcher, and mother of four children. Born and raised in rural Nova Scotia, she moved to Ontario in 1985. Minister Anand is a devoted leader with a proven record of service. For the past two decades, Minister Anand has been a legal academic employed most recently as a professor of law at the University of Toronto, where she held the J.R. Kimber Chair in Investor Protection and Corporate Governance. Minister Anand, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Jay Neal, for that introduction. And it's just wonderful to be here with everyone. I'm ecstatic. And this may be the funnest meeting I've been in all day. So um, <laughs> we have to remember to smile when those moments arrive. Um, I'm just honored to be here with everyone. And I thought what I would do is just speak a little bit about Canada's vaccine procurements. Uh, you'll probably know that I have been leading the government's efforts in procuring vaccines. And the task began last summer when we put into place seven bilateral agreements with leading vaccine suppliers. At that time, every country in the world was seeking the same product and the same contract essentially uh, for some type of guarantee that they would have access to vaccines. As a result of our seven agreements, we were very well placed when a vaccine, and in particular two vaccines, those of Pfizer and Moderna, showed very, uh, very high efficacy rates in November uh, to begin our conversation with the vaccine suppliers about how Canada needed to be at the front of the line for delivery of vaccine. And we were one of the first countries to begin inoculations in December and uh, have continued to ramp up so that today uh, we have distributed 34 million vaccines to provinces and territories who have administered about 30 million of those vaccines and almost 75% of eligible Canadians have had at least one dose of vaccine. Now, the fear I have is that Canadians will rest on their success in the sense that they may feel that going for their second shot is not necessary for some reason or the other. We are not there yet. We are not there yet. We have more road to travel in this inoculation campaign that is gripping the world, but certainly here in Canada, it is the government's focus to ensure that there's enough vaccine to distribute to provinces and territories so that all Canadians can have two doses of vaccine. And so while we are very pleased with being first in the G7 and the G20 and the OECD, and it certainly has been a very long haul to get us to this place, we have to keep our eye on that second dose goal. And in that respect, um, I just thought I would mention that we have um, in the country uh, this week alone about 9 million vaccines 
coming in one week. We had 9.5 million vaccines coming over three months at the beginning of 2021. So as I have consistently said, the vaccine supply is continuing to ramp up and it will, this, this ramp up of vaccine procurements will continue to increase at a very, very steady rate. Um, we will have at least 55 million vaccines here before the end of July and tomorrow I will update that number. So it looks very good for Canada, but the will must be there in the people. <laughs> the will must be there in every Canadian who wants to have a second shot to go and get that shot. And the work that the frontline healthcare workers around this table are doing, my sister Sonia, Dr. Pai, Dr. Graval, Dr. Chagla, so, so important to recognize their incredible contribution to ensuring that Canadians will have two shots of vaccine. So I am in charge of the supply, but that's only half the battle. It's really making sure that we have Canadians inoculated and our timeline continues to move up. Uh, we, can, we will for sure have enough supply for all Canadians to be vaccinated prior to the end of September. But the role that I play every day is to negotiate with the suppliers. I just got off the phone with Pfizer, for example, to say we need more vaccines and we need them sooner. So we put in place those contracts last summer. That was step one. But every single day, we are working the contracts to perform and deliver more and more vaccines for Canadians. And so that's what my role has been. And actually, some people joke around with me and say, did you ever think that when you ran for office that you would be doing this? Well, none of us thought we were going to be doing this, <laughs> whether you're in government or not. Um, but I certainly did not you know, expect to win and then expect to get appointed to cabinet. And then when I took on this role um, and the prime minister asked me to be the minister of public services and procurement, I of course said yes, but I didn't really truly understand all that it would entail because the pandemic had not hit. And since that time, we have procured 7.2 billion items of PPE over 40 million rapid tests, and we will have over 100 million vaccines in this country prior to the end of September. So I will leave it there. I will just say it's a huge honor to be among such an illustrious group of people this evening. Um, I'm willing to take any questions if you have them, uh, but I certainly don't wanna overstay my welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you, Anita. And maybe we could take some questions, uh, Sujani, for the minister before she has to go to her next Zoom call. So I'll hand it to you, Sujani, to help us get those questions to the minister. Absolutely. And if anybody does have any questions for Minister Anand, please uh, feel free to uh, put them in the chat or you can raise your hand using the reaction button at the very bottom. If you click that, you can see a raise hand option. Yes, we have a question uh, from Robin. Please go ahead. Hi, yes, uh, thank you. It's great seeing everybody. Um, thank you, Minister Anand, for the um, for the welcome, and uh, really appreciate all that you've done for, for Canadians uh, procuring the vaccines. Uh, my question is in regards to booster shots. Will Canada have procured enough in the coming months for boosters, should we need them? It's a fantastic question, Robin. Thank you so much for asking it. Uh, so the focus of my remarks has been and is often on the short term. What are we getting this week? What are we getting this month? What are we getting next month? Uh, but let's 
definitely not uh, imagine that I also haven't been focusing on the future as your question suggests we must. So at the same time as focusing on getting millions of vaccines into the country today, this week, this month, I am also focusing on the long term. What happens if we need boosters? What happens if we need enhanced vaccines or additional age groups or nuances relating to the vaccines are developed? So what we did in direct response to your question now is to put in place a foundational contract with Pfizer for the provision of 65 million vaccines or boosters or other enhanced products that they develop and that receive Health Canada approval to ensure that we have access to boosters over 2022, 2023, and 2024. Uh, so this is a a very broad-based long-term contract with Pfizer to ensure that we have access to the variety of products that may be developed and then approved by Health Canada. And that's just the beginning of our work to procure boosters and the like. We, we are continuing to discuss this issue with other leading suppliers and making sure that we have in place the contractual foundation to draw down on uh, additional innovations that they bring to market for the health and welfare of Canadians and uh, global citizens. And I'd just like to give a very large shout out to, uh, this is our shot. I will say we are lucky to have Dr. Raj Gruel here with us. He's wearing the t-shirt. Um, and I have one myself, I should have put it on. Uh, but just to say that the work that This Is Our Shot is doing to make sure that we can get people to use the vaccines that the country is buying by the millions is so important. Let me tell you, we have to use these vaccines. We're bringing them in by the millions and they save lives. So I'm sure... Um, Raj will speak to this when he um, speaks at the podium, but let's just say thanks and hats off to that incredible organization as well as uh, your spouse, Raj, who's done great work. Thank you, Minister Anand. We have another one in the chat here. So it says, how much is the cost of each vial and did we get a discount on buying in bulk? Well, thank you so much. Uh, we have spent in aggregate about $8 billion on vaccine. The terms of the vaccine contracts specifically relating to price, for example, are confidential and they're governed by confidentiality clauses that I am not at liberty to disclose. In fact, I don't think Canadians want me to breach our vaccine contracts because then we won't be getting vaccines. Uh, so I am very conscious to make sure that we have positive relationships with the suppliers, we abide by the terms of our contracts, and we can protect Canada's vaccine supply chain. That is so incredibly important. Um, we are able to have the contracts that we do because of the strong negotiating position that we took back in August, where we made sure we had preferable terms for Canada in terms of, for example, not accepting product that did not have Health Canada approval was a condition uh, across the board. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Anand. We've got time to take one more question for you. And I'll ask uh, Jyothika Desai. Uh, you've had your hand up. So please uh, go ahead and ask your question to Minister Anand. Um, I think just yesterday, the U.S. said that for, a, for example, a concert, uh, Canadians who've taken a first dose of AstraZeneca wouldn't be allowed um, to attend. So is this going to be something we see going forward where, you know, people who have had the AstraZeneca vaccine, regardless of their second dose, are now going to be denied entry into countries as we travel or events going forward? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And let's just take a step back to what the United States approved. So they approved, the FDA approved Moderna, Pfizer, and J&J, &J, just like Canada, but they didn't approve AstraZeneca, while Canada and many, many other countries did. 
And what that means is when um, theaters on Broadway or other organizations make their conditions for entry, they are using the term approved by the FDA vaccines. And so because AstraZeneca is not an FDA approved vaccine, the inference is that individuals cannot access those organizations or in the case of your question, cross the border. This is a very, very new issue that has come up as we begin to discuss how to open the border, when to open the border and who can cross that border. Uh, so it is obviously an issue for uh, the government to continue to negotiate with in terms of our discussions with the United States. Um, and I am very hopeful that we will get to a place that people who are inoculated with AstraZeneca are indeed able to access the theater and cross the border, but there does need to be some conversation and negotiation there. I'm sure we will get to a, uh, to a positive outcome, uh, but there is some negotiations to do on that front. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Anand, and thank you to everybody that posed a question. Um, you can keep them coming in the chat, and we'll try to get them get to them at the end if if possible. So thank you. Thank um, you so much. And thank you for all your hard work uh, for for the country. It's greatly appreciated. Now we will move on everybody to present to you our extraordinary medical panel of experts who are here to help answer your questions and concerns about the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we will begin with very short introductions on the four of them, move on to some pre-submitted questions that we received, and then we will wrap up with a live audience Q&A. Our first panelist is Dr. Sonia Anand. Dr. Anand is a professor in the Department of Medicine and the director of the Population Genomics Program at McMaster University. She is also a senior scientist at the Population Health Research Institute at Hamilton Health Sciences. Dr. Anand holds a Canada Research Chair in Ethnic Diversity and Cardiovascular Disease and the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Ontario, Michael G. DeGroote Chair in Population Health Research. Her current research focuses on environmental and genetic determinants of vascular disease in women and populations of varying ancestral origin. She is also the principal investigator on two recent studies that are exploring COVID-19 vaccine confidence and immune response in South Asian and First Nations peoples. Awesome. And then next up, we have Dr. Zain Chagla, an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University an infectious disease physician in Hamilton, and is also involved with tropical and global health. He's been involved in several media and communications, infection control, outbreak management, and clinical trials for COVID-19. I'm sure you may not have missed Dr. Chagla by now. Thank you, Dr. Chagla, for coming. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Menika Pai. Dr. Pai is an Associate Professor of Medicine at McMaster University and the Head of Service for Benign Hematology at Hamilton Health Sciences. She is a member of Ontario's COVID-19 Science Advisory Table. Her clinical interests focus on bleeding and clotting, and her research focuses on how we can communicate about science so that healthcare professionals can make the best treatment choices for their patients. Excellent. And then last but certainly not the least, we have Dr. Raj Graywal, who is an emergency physician at Hamilton Health Sciences, assistant professor at McMaster, and co-founder of the South Asian COVID Task Force, and current medical director at both the Embassy Grand Vaccine and Testing Center in the Peel region. Thank you, Dr. Graywal, for having for being here. Amazing. So we'll start with the submitted questions first, and we have a specific question for each of the panelists to get us going. Awesome. So I'll start with Dr. Chagla. So Dr. Chagla, I have a question here that says, I've received my second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. And now, is it okay for me to now walk outside, go to the public places without mask? Why hasn't Health Canada announced something like what the CDC has done with regards to the guidelines? And why should people get the vaccines if they're not going to be allowed to return to normalcy? That's a great question. And uh, I think all of us are, are looking forward to that day where we live, you know, back where 2019 was. 
you know, I, I, these vaccines are amazing and, and, uh, and, you know, great thanks to everyone on the call and Minister Anand who have been, you know, instrumental in some of the rollout locally. Um, you know, the, 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 the end game of these vaccines is to get everyone fully vaccinated. And that really creates two conditions. One, your ability to transmit COVID-19 goes down significantly, but two, in the worst case scenario that you were exposed to COVID-19, your risk of serious complications, hospitalization or death, or even acquiring COVID-19 goes down significantly. And so, you know, I, when, when we are where we are now, we have people that are partially vaccinated, fully vaccinated and unvaccinated. And those mixtures still create conditions where people can get COVID-19, get sick from COVID-19 and end up hospitalized and dying with COVID-19. And this is why, you know, that public facing, how we interact with each other outside of our own households uh, becomes very difficult to tell people to, to change their behavior right now until we get to a point where everyone is protected or everyone who wants to be protected is protected. Um, the United States, is, as, as, as was mentioned, has put out rules for how do people can behave, certain things people can do. Certainly people can be outside and, and as long as they're physically distancing, they don't necessarily need a mask. Um, but, you know, indoor settings, there's still a need for masking just to protect others from, from yourself. Um, and uh, and uh, especially when interacting with people with different vaccine status, you want to be very careful as, as those people are still vulnerable to some of the complications, particularly with variants circulating. So, you know, I think we're going to get to a point, certainly, with a lot of vaccines getting out there. Uh, I know the provincial and, and uh, uh, the provincial government here in Ontario is working on a strategy to give people some um, some guidelines on how to act when they're fully vaccinated and what things they can do and what things they can't do. Um, but uh, but for now, I think you know adhering to the precautions publicly are still important just to make sure that you know people as they're going through the vaccine series have have the opportunity to be protected uh, until again we get to a point where we all get our vaccines, which and you know according to Minister Anand seems to be coming uh, sooner and sooner and sooner by the day. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Chagla, for that. Um, our next question is for you, Dr. Pai, um, and it goes like this. My friend got severe complications from taking the vaccine. He was even hospitalized for a blood clot. I work from home, live alone, and barely leave my house, so I would rather risk getting COVID-19 than the unknown potential side effects from the vaccine. If my risk for transmission is low, why should I risk getting the vaccine? And perhaps this is a question of particular interest because some preliminary findings from our COVID community study has also shown that over 65% of South Asian people living in Ontario worry about the unknown future effects of vaccines. That's, that's a, a great question. I, I'm going to start, Johnny, by saying um, worrying is normal. Right. Um, and, and especially if you have somebody you really care about who had an adverse effect, you're going to worry about that person. When you think about your vaccination, you're going to think about your friend and you're going to be anxious. And I think that's a normal human um, reaction. You know, and I'll, I guess I'll start by saying, you know, when we, when we make that decision about the vaccine, we have to weigh our risk of getting it, which we'll talk about in a second, with our with our risk of not getting it. And I think Dr. Shagla, as an infectious disease physician, has outlined it really well. So um, the person who's asked the question is saying, listen, I'm at home. I'm alone. I don't leave my house. But society is opening up. Um, and, and there's there's still a risk of encountering COVID because it's still circulating in our community. And so, you know, getting vaccinated, I think we'll all agree, is a way to break those chains of circulation, keep yourself safe and keep others safe. But, but you know, what about those unknown side effects? So, you know, I will tell you that like many medications, vaccines can cause complications. So, for example, after you get a COVID vaccine for the first 48 hours, you might not feel very well. That's a pretty normal immune reaction. It's not dangerous, but if you're not prepared for it, it can be scary. There are more serious effects. So I'm a blood clot doctor, and we know after that first shot of AstraZeneca, one in every 65,000 people who got that first shot, they did get serious blood clots. So I think we have to acknowledge that you know those risks are real. Um, but Sajani, what I'd say to our, our questioner is that um, thanks to Minister Nan, thanks to her colleagues, we have lots of safe choices for vaccines now. We know the mRNA vaccines have no risk of blood clots. 
We know that the risk of blood clots is much lower with a second dose of AstraZeneca. That's why Health Canada has approved it for use in the country. And I think maybe the most important thing which I keep in mind, as of today, almost 900 million people around the world have gotten a, a shot of a COVID vaccine, at least one. And countries around the world are working together to monitor vaccine safety. So we are ready to spot side effects, known side effects, unknown side effects, and, and we can react. We've already done so in this process. Um, and, and the government agencies and docs like us are committed um, to, to really improving and continuing surveillance so we can keep you safe. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Pai. That was very helpful. Okay, so the next question I have is for Dr. Anand. So uh, the question is, why are you studying immunity from the COVID-19 vaccine, particularly in the South Asian population now? Does that mean that it, it's not safe in the population? Should we just wait until we have more data? Why would it be different in the South Asian community anyways? Thank you very much, Janiel, for that question. And first I would say that we have excellent randomized control trial data that have proven the efficacy of the vaccines against COVID-19. So it's high quality evidence and we have great efficacy, which means that they're 95% effective in preventing COVID-19. So that's great. And that's why we're so confident in the vaccine. It, the antibody response is something times what we refer to as immunogenicity. So after you get the vaccine, how quickly and by how much do your antibodies to the spike protein on the COVID virus start to rise? And those studies, you can read them in the primary New England Journal of Medicine papers, have been done in volunteers and there are not very many uh, non-white Caucasian participants in those studies as well as the randomized trials. If we look at the United States randomized trials, the South Asians are grouped into a category called Asian, which could also include Southeast Asian and people from China, et cetera. So we don't have South Asian specific uh, data in a, in a large scale that shows us the antibody response to the vaccine. Although we expect it will be robust, just like it was in the volunteers in the white Caucasian population. The reason why it's important to study is we've seen from the United Kingdom that South Asians have eight to tenfold increased infectivity rate with COVID-19 and a one and a half to twofold increased mortality once we get COVID-19. We're not sure all of the reasons for that. But one component we would like to clarify is the immune response to the vaccine is as robust as it is in white Caucasians. And also we know that comorbid factors, meaning things like diabetes, chronic diseases, chronic lung disease, older age can all affect our immune response. So in our Canadian study, we're recruiting 3000 South Asians from the greater Toronto area and greater Vancouver area. And we are going to study that immune response to the COVID-19 vaccine and how long that immune response maintains the high level of antibodies. So we'll measure it at the beginning and then at six months and even beyond that to determine how long does that antibody titer stay high. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Um, our next question is for Dr. Raj Graywal. Uh, Dr. Graywal, you've been um, a real, really instrumental in um, improving access in the Peel region. So this question is coming to you uh, from the perspective of an international student. The question is, I am an international student and I don't have a health card. Um, am I still eligible to get the vaccine? What do I bring with me if not the health card? And what will happen if I have a side effect after the vaccine? Do I have to pay for treatment? Uh, thanks, Johnny, for that uh, question. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of this at the Embassy Grand uh, here in the Peel region, which is a hot spot in uh, in, in, the, in the province. Uh, and we can get into why that is in a minute. But we're getting a lot of international students that had that same exact question. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I had kind of gone out to. Uh, 
uh, did some outreach into some grocery stores in, 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 uh, in, in the Peel region uh, in, in where we are right now with the embassy. And, and that was one of the, the questions is that they were, they were worried about they had to pay for the vaccine uh, or that they had to, to have a health card. And those are absolutely not true. So uh, as long as you're a resident of Canada, uh, or, and again, in the Peel region, if you're a resident of, of Peel region uh, and you have some sort of government ID, it could be a passport from India, uh, and you can still get the vaccine. And so uh, that was something that our outreach team was, was, was doing, have been doing in the last couple of weeks, just to educate uh, our community that uh, you really don't need to pay for it and you don't need to have a, a, a health card. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, the other thing we realized is that how do you get the message out besides doing outreach? And that was really uh, tapping into channels that they use. And that, that's for social media. That's like WhatsApp channels. And so uh, getting that message out through WhatsApp channels is really important to get the message out. Uh, and so uh, that's what I would say to them is, uh, is, is really it, it's free. Uh, come and get it. You need your two doses uh, to protect you against the Delta variant that we're seeing now in, in the Peel region. Um, and so that's what I would say. Yeah, and then uh, I just have a follow-up question here to that, actually. So you kind of alluded to this, Dr. Grewal, but what are some of the key things that you and your team have done to help the uh, South Asian community in Peel specifically better access COVID testing and vaccines? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, Dr. Dubé had, uh, had, had touched on it and how our, our community is, is more disproportionately affected. Uh, and one of the reasons we, we saw in, uh, in, in, uh, in Peel region is that, you know, a larger proportion of our, our South Asian community, uh, you know, are putting food on the table of all Canadians. You know, they are the essential workers. Um, they, you know, uh, Peel region is a, a large distribution hub for the province. Um, uh, you know, we've got Amazon warehouses, a lot of different uh, distribution uh, houses. So they, they're the essential workers and a lot of them come from uh, multi-generational families. Uh, and so, you know, that coupled together, uh, you know, if one person gets COVID, they all kind of get COVID. And we realized that, and that was really the, uh, what, what happened uh, when we started this uh, back in November, uh, we were kind of lobbying sort of uh, or advocating for our community there uh, to say, hey, you know, we've got more, you know, COVID here in this community and, and uh, we need more testing. But they were saying uh, that, that, uh, the, that we weren't using it uh, and there was, uh, um, you know, th that the testing wasn't being used. And we realized that it really was it, the fact that there wasn't, uh, you know, culturally appropriate uh, care in a language that our community understood, um, and, uh, and 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 you know that was a, this was a lack of access uh, because of that. And so we wanted to change that. So the South Asian COVID Task Force really advocated for more testing, and that's what happened. We got a, a testing center in, in the heart and the uh, in a hot spot in 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 the Peel region, um, and we started uh, uh, really uh, providing care uh, in a place like the Embassy Grand, where almost everyone had gone for a wedding. Uh, South Asians in, in that Peel region had gone for a wedding. They, they trusted that that uh, that venue. They trusted the doctors that the South Asian COVID Task Force doctors were on all ethnic media within uh, a month to to get that message out, get that culturally appropriate messaging out in in uh, in a way that our community understood. And Jane Neal was also responsible for doing a lot of the infographics uh, for the South Asian COVID Task Force to to really uh, get messaging out in, in Punjabi and other languages so that uh, we could battle the misinformation that was happening around uh, testing and COVID. Uh, and so that's kind of uh, how, how things started uh, back in, uh, in, in January uh, at the testing center and now the vaccine center in, in the same area where, you know, again, it's so vitally important to have uh, a place where we can vaccinate our, our community um, and, and have them be able to book in, in a language they understand. So we have a booking platform that's in, in, in multiple languages uh, from English and French, Hindi, Punjabi, Urdu. So we, we were able to have our community book testing and vaccines in their own language, which wasn't there before um, and that's uh, that was super important excellent thank you for sharing that we see in the chat that um that we have some conversation around it possibly being helpful to send international student eligibility for vaccine information to colleges and universities um, we've got some questions there that have been asked to some of our, our attendees so that might be a potential avenue from this um, Dr. Graywell, uh, why around this access uh, and questions around access, um, why have you made this your mission and what have you learned along the way that you'd like to share with the South Asian community? Um, well, I mean, uh, you know, for me, you know, I, 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 this is really personal for me because I'm a ER physician in Hamilton, but everyone's like, why are you going all the way to Peel region to do this in a hot spot? Um, for me, you know, I was born in Peel region. My mom and dad still live there. It really means a lot to me, uh, you know, and when you've got, you know, 
uh, when I see my patients there, it's like my uncles and aunties, my, my, um, you know, my brothers and sisters. So, you know, you know, we've always had disparities uh, with respect to healthcare, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, with respect to our, our South Asian community, but I think it's, it's really, um, you know, I, I think we got to use our voices to, to really help our South Asian community and that's what I've, I've done and made that my mission because I think it's just vitally important to, uh, to be that voice for, for those uh, in our community that may not have that voice. And so um, that, that's the reason why, why I'm doing what I'm doing. And, and uh, yeah, we're just hoping to continue to push this, you know, last, uh, the next two, three months to, to continue to get uh, doses into arms and really, uh, really push to get everyone two doses uh, in their arms. And, and so uh, it's, it's, it's just really amazing to be, be vaccinating our own South Asian community there. I just, uh, it's it just wonderful to see that and wonderful to see the, the smiles on people's faces as they come in to, to get vaccinated uh, uh, by people that look like them that, that, that speak their language. And it's, it's, it's incredible. And if I could just add to that, I think Raj picking up on your point, every one of us has something to offer. And so we often focus on healthcare workers uh, as being frontline, but we have seen teachers, community workers, journalists, so many South Asians amplify the South Asian issues. And it has really been this collective action that has kind of turned the course for things in the Peel region. So I would just give uh, credit to everyone here. I know on my own research team with people like Jay Neal and, and Sujani, Farah, Deepika, everyone has said, we just want to help in some way. So I thank everybody here because I know you all have been doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually that uh, idea of the collective goes into the next question, which I, I think is open to the entire panel. So the question is, there's this notion that we hear in the news and on social media that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And this is referring to global vaccine equity, but how do we achieve that exactly? And should we be sending out vaccines to countries in need before, let's say, uh, prioritizing children at home who are somewhat at a lower risk? Uh, or this is even more important, especially because in our study, the COVID-19 uh, community study, we see that approximately 60% of the participants believe that vaccines can cause unforeseen problems in children. just be, I'm not on the panel, but I could just speak to the government's position on this, um, because it is actually our Prime Minister who does often use the phrase, as do I, that no one is safe until everyone is safe, and I think what is meant by that is it's a policy position of our government that not only are we procuring vaccines for Canadians, but we have also uh, donated millions of dollars to the COVAX facility. Uh, over $300 million, in fact, to COVAX, our multilateral procurement uh, pooled mechanism of uh, doses, vaccines for distribution to the developing world. And so we really have, again, a two-track approach to vaccine procurement. The first track is procuring and delivering vaccines for Canadians here at home, and at the same time, ensuring that we are living up to our commitment to multilateralism and to the developing world. And in that vein, our prime minister just committed 100 million vaccines to the developing world when he was at the G7. And I will say that there are a lot of naysayers out there who believe that Canada is uh, not committed to the developing world. I want to say that that is completely false. And in fact, in terms of the recent third wave in India, uh, we made sure very quickly to... Uh, sorry, Minister Anand, we can't hear you well. Your voice is very faint. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I had my head, my head, my head set up. It's better now. Oh, my sincere apologies. I thought you were going to say that you could hear my kids fighting in the kitchen, but... I guess that's not what you were saying. In any case, I'll just finish off to say that when the third wave was hitting India very hard, we sent ventilators, we sent oxygenators, we sent supplies, um, and we sent batches of supplies to India. Uh, so I will say that we have a very, very strong commitment to multilateralism as well as protecting Canadians. And that is a two-track approach. I'm working very hard with Minister Gould our Minister of International Development and Minister Garneau, our Minister of uh, Global Affairs to make sure that we do not forget our neighbors and friends across the world.
maybe I'll, I'll just jump in for a second, Sajani and Janiel. So, um, you know, I think a lot of us, well, none of us on this call are responsible for vaccine procurement directly, except Minister Anand. So, I, you know, I think there's also sometimes this feeling that this is a really big problem and it's really overwhelming. And I'll tell you my take on global vaccine equity. One of the most challenging parts I have learned about vaccination is, is in part of its supply, but then part of it is acceptance. You know, are, are people around the world getting vaccines? Sure, that is important. Are people around the world confident about vaccines. I mean, that's another really important question. So I would just encourage you, and I hope that I hope this discussion is going to help all of you. And I hope we all learn new things and we learn about facts. But one important thing we can all do, especially South Asians, we tend to be very connected with our families back home. We're always on WhatsApp. We're always FaceTiming them. So, you know, I, I would sort of challenge you if you hear anything that really resonates with you and makes you feel confident and positive today, share those with the people you love back home, you know, I'm confident our government is sending vaccines to them, um, but let's, you know, make them feel good about it and combat disinformation. So when those vaccines come, you know, they 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 take it with optimism to, to stay safe. So that's my small scale suggestion about global vaccine equity, because that's all I can really affect. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Pai. Uh, Dr. Chagla, Dr. Graywell, did you want to comment, uh, Dr. Anand, on, on the global vaccine equity question? I just want to say, I mean, I mean, we're just, you know, fortunate and privileged to live in Canada. And I think that we need to support global efforts in, in, in getting vaccine into, uh, into other third world countries. You know, I, I look at, you know, Peel region is a hotspot, but you can look at the world as a hotspot and where there are hotspots, we need to get vaccine there. Uh, the hotspots that we know are, are in Africa and India and, and other places. Uh, and, and I've got loved ones in India that are, being, uh, that have been affected by COVID and, and uh, I really, uh, uh, I'm really, uh, you know, pleased by uh, Minister Anand's words, and um, you know, I, I think that uh, we need to continue to do that uh, as, you know, morally and uh, as as humanitarians, uh, Canadians, we, we need to continue to to get vaccine uh, to these uh, third world countries and making sure that uh, they're also protected because uh, if they're not protected, we're not protected, and we'll probably be dealing with more variants of concerns in the, in the near future. So. And so, Johnny, I see a lot of great questions in the chat with respect to some of the side effects. And so, as we have heard, we have a great supply of vaccines in the country, but there are still some pockets of our community where people are a bit hesitant to take the vaccine. And maybe we can talk through some of those issues now. Um, and so, I'll, I'll, I know you've been curating the questions, but... Uh, Let's start there. Sounds good. So we'll start with one of the first questions in the chat there. Um, if you can comment on safety of taking a Pfizer vaccine when the first dose was AstraZeneca. Uh, Dr. Pai, would you like to start off on that? I'm, I'm gonna start off and I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Shagla extremely quickly. <laughs> Uh, because of his depth of experience, you know, I'm just I'm just going to make a general statement about mixing and matching vaccines because I think that's what people are asking about. Um, uh, Dr. Shagla, I hope you can comment on you know the safety and, and efficacy of this, but I will say mixing and matching isn't totally new. So um, there are many many diseases where we start with one kind of vaccine, we prime people and then we boost up their immune system with another. So that's based on really good vaccine science. In fact, you have probably received vaccines where you didn't even know you were mixing and matching. So a lot of things around COVID sound really new. We've actually been doing them for a while. So for me, you know, it's about getting two doses in, getting them in practically and quickly. And for a lot of people that that is mixing um, and matching. And now I will hand it over to my infectious disease colleague. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, thank you, uh, Dr. Pai. And yeah, I, I reiterate that. I mean, you know, the way we do many of our vaccines from young to old involve mixing. And, you know, even our flu shot every year is is maybe a different brand. And, and so we certainly do see that. Um, I will I'll also say that, um, you know, these vaccines do the same thing, essentially, especially ones that are approved in Canada. They, they make you make a spike protein, which is kind of the, the immune trigger for your immune system. And so whether you do it with an AstraZeneca vaccine or Pfizer vaccine, the end effect is pretty much the same. And so, you know, people get alarmed with mixing these vaccines, 
But in reality, your body is doing the exact same thing. It's, it's seeing spike protein and it's making a response to the spike protein. Um, so, you know, in, in, in the studies that looked at mixing vaccines, you know, we, we, uh, we just see that people's immune systems are a bit triggered by that second vaccine when they mix. Um, that's, you know, a normal response. That means your body is actually kind of seen something, it's reacting to it, it's trying to, to develop a really robust long-term immune response. And that, that's what really leads to those side effects. And again, they're, they're a sore arm, they're feeling off for a day or two, fatigue, fever, and they largely settled down within a day or two after vaccine. So, you know, I, I would not worry about the safety profile. And, and, uh, and there's a big study in the UK that published their results around safety that really did suggest that, that other than, you know, a little bit of that, that side effect towards the arm and feeling a bit unwell the day afterwards, that things were uh, relatively stable and people went on as normal and nothing serious occurred. Uh, and we heard today again the the, uh, the announcement from our, our uh, NACI, our federal organization, where they actually recommended that people get uh, the second dose of mRNA if they've received either a first dose of mRNA or an AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and that's based on the safety. It's based on the supplies, thanks to, again, Mr. Anand and, and uh, the work on Pfizer and Moderna. And that's actually based on some early data coming out of countries that have been doing this that actually do show um, not only that the responses are relatively good, there's actually a couple of small studies suggesting the responses may be better and actually may even be better than people that got two doses of mRNA vaccine. So, you know, this is where that pivot is, is if we're going to, you know, mix and match vaccines, we want our population to get the best series possible, the safest series possible, uh, and, um, and the most easy to access series possible. And, and, uh, and again, right now, that's uh, following up the uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine with an mRNA vaccine afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Chagla. And jumping off of that, I see a question in the chat here about how long um, after receiving the second dose of vaccine does it take the body to build up antibodies against COVID and its variants? So some have heard seven days, some say 14. Uh, can you provide some clarity around that, please? Uh, I can follow that up. So um, when, when the Pfizer trial was done, they looked at seven days afterwards. So people who got Pfizer and then Pfizer within either three and as max six weeks. When the Moderna trial was done, they looked at 14 days. But if you look at the data, actually that seven days is probably still in the same ballpark in that sense. Um, and with AstraZeneca, they looked at 14 days. And again, you know, th these are a little bit arbitrary cutoffs. Your body doesn't kind of turn on day uh, uh, between day 13 hello? and 14. Um, there's a there's a difference, you know, your body has a gradual response. Also, remember, when you get the second dose, you've already seen the first dose, your body knows what it's doing, all it's doing is reinforcing things for the long term. So, you know, as much as we say a week, or two weeks, it's really that you have protection, you're just kind of getting long term or optimal protection in that sense. But, you know, right now, the recommendation given all the mixing matching is two weeks, just to be careful and safe. But you know, most people, I think by about a week or so, are starting to get that final immune response that will stay with them for months and months and months afterwards. Yeah, and that, I would just echo that. We've kind of been using a seven day uh, kind of safety period and then you know, go into higher risk zones is okay. I think Dr. Dubé may have a comment. You're muted right now, Dr. Dubé. Gotcha. Uh, I would like to say that for when India got their um, their crisis, we sent over 300 oxygenators from Vishnu Temple. And also recently we sent 360 cylinders because they say they wanted cylinders. I, that's an FYI. But the question, the medical questions I would like to, which I have not heard addressed tonight. I knew of a patient who got myocarditis after Pfizer and died. I, I, I don't think because of Pfizer, I, uh, wrong, sorry. She got Pfizer and uh, two weeks after she got sick, but she did have cardiomegaly and hypertension before all of this. Well, this is a comorbidity which caused this to happen, but is there, can anyone address myocarditis, Pfizer? Thank you. I'll take a first stab and then open it up. You're right, and people have probably heard in the news that uh, especially young men 
there has been a report that myocarditis might occur. What is myocarditis? It can be some inflammation of the heart or edema, swelling in the heart. And this was first noticed in Israel because as you know, Israel rolled out their vaccines rapidly. Yes. And what they observed are generally men, there were six cases of young people between 20, well, actually 16 to 45, came to the emergency room with some chest discomfort. The first thing they did is excluded COVID positivity because COVID itself puts a strain on the heart. So excluded that measured enzymes that kind of said, yes, there's some heart damage, we call them troponin. It looked like there was some inflammation. And when they did an MRI scan and looked right at the heart, they could see a bit of edema or swelling in the heart. The good news is uh, this occurred in six people, men, over a one month period. And they, the typical course was in hospital under observation, sometimes anti-inflammatories were used and everybody was discharged after four to eight days. So it did occur at a slightly higher rate than myocarditis generally occurs. It can occur with a bad flu, for example. They've noticed in Israel a slightly higher rate of myocarditis compared to the general population rates for a one month period. So it, is an observation from Israel and all countries around the world are collecting similar safety data. So for that, we'll have to wait and see. And from the initial reports, there aren't particular types of people that seem prone to developing this or risk factors that have been identified yet, but research is ongoing. Can I, can I ask you a question, mm -hmm. Sadia? Uh, I mean, Professor Adler, sorry. Um, if, a, if a patient has a predisposing cardiac problem, especially uh, a previous myocardial infarction or something like that, would that person be susceptible as far as you know? No, I don't think so. There's no okay. evidence to suggest that because that occurs with a different process typically in the coronary arteries. And there is no evidence that the COVID-19 vaccine destabilizes those types of patients. I, I would like to ask one other question to Dr. Chagra, the urologist. When patients get, it, get COVID, when they're diagnosed with COVID and they're symptomatic, fever, not short of breath yet, should they be on any anticoagulant? You, because that has not been uh, talked about here tonight. Should there be an anticoagulant prophylactically? Uh, and you know what I'm talking about. And, or, and should also they start with steroid prophylactic, not prophylactically, but after having symptoms. I know that steroids have been overused in India and this has, what has caused this, the, this mucor, mucus, whatever disease, where they lose their eyes, et cetera, et cetera. The black, what, what's the disease called? Uh, the black fungus, yeah. Black yeah, the black fungus. fungus. That and yeah. I, I was told by Dr. Sabir Gupta from, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, St. Mike's, who we are working closely with with this COVID thing too. And um, he said, because the steroids were being overused and inadvertently used, so much so that where we sent the, these oxygenators and et cetera, et cetera. These people are asking me, can you send some dexamethasone for me? So I said, you know, who prescribed the dexamethasone? He said, oh, we just give it to the Gurdwara or the temple, give it to people. So I said, oh, no, that's, that's a drug that you give out. Even as a surgeon, I know you do, you, do, <laughs> you do not give out steroid just like that. So can you comment yeah. on these things? Yeah, happy to. And I'll, I'll leave uh, the anticoagulation piece to Dr. Pai because like, clearly she's the expert here. Um, uh, you know, that you're, you're absolutely right about the steroid piece. So steroids are an essential medication for COVID-19. They're used for people who have a lot of inflammation for their COVID-19, um, uh, but they've been studied with the best evidence in people that require oxygen, not people that are well at home that don't require oxygen. And in fact, in the clinical trials they did of steroids, the people that didn't require oxygen actually had a higher risk of death 
when they got steroids early. And then and I think we we learned in India as well. Um, you know, we we know unfortunately our, our the the uh, South Asian population has a lot of undiagnosed or even poorly treated diabetes. On the top of getting steroids, you know, it is the right formula for getting this this black fungus. And and uh, and unfortunately, what we saw with it, amongst the other complications of high blood sugar and other other things that happen with it. So, steroids are only meant to be given, you know, in, in our setting, typically only in hospital. Uh, in India, they were given a little bit out uh, in the context of things because healthcare was such a, a, a rare resource in, in some settings. Um, but you know, they're, they're not supposed to be given to people who are not requiring oxygen. As again, it might be I mean, the, the evidence suggests it's actually dangerous in that setting, and there's secondary complications that we have mentioned. Uh, and I'll, I'll I'll toss the next one over to uh, Dr. Pai here. Thank, thank you, Dr. Shackle. The, the, you know, the story on blood thinners is, is there's some similar themes here. Um, so I guess what I'll, I'll tell you first is if you are at home and you do get COVID, but you are still well enough to be at home and you're on blood thinners for a separate reason, um, whether it's a, an irregular heart rate or whether you've had blood clots before, you should stay on the blood thinner that your doctor prescribed for you. That's okay. That's good. Um, but what I'll also tell you is um, we don't have any evidence to say that if you weren't already on a blood thinner, that you should start it. So it's the same story as dexamethasone. You know, if you're not sick enough to be in a hospital and be assessed by, by a specialized physician, you should not be taking blood thinners, starting them at home. And I think that that common theme of blood thinners like steroids have real risks. They can actually be really harmful. So you, you don't want to start taking things, you know, just in case, um, because they can certainly cause more harm than good. And I would just add an at the Population Health Research Institute, we're leading a trial to evaluate a couple of these questions. So patients, um, as outpatients, we're testing if aspirin can reduce cardiovascular outcomes and death in patients who develop COVID-19. And in hospital, different cocktails of blood thinners together with aspirin. And same goes for other anti-inflammatories like colchicine. So we have more research and more randomized trials needed to help direct us. And I would also finally echo what Dr. Pai says, that I have had patients who said, because I got a bit of a cough, I went into the medicine cabinet and I took my husband's blood thinners just in case to cover me. Do not do that. Do not self-medicate. Do not use your spouse's or your mother or father's blood thinners or steroids. Go to hospital and all the doctors will treat you well. Awesome. All right, we have another question here that I think is quite relevant right now. So it asks, what is the likelihood of breakthrough infections for fully vaccinated individuals due to the Delta variant, specifically referring to the Calgary Foothills Hospital Delta outbreak where two people died, both in their 80s, one of whom was fully vaccinated. Can someone speak to this? So um, the 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 Delta variant is, as we all know, um, you know, may evade vaccines slightly more than typical uh, variants that have been circulating in, in COVID nineteen as it was before. Now, it's really important to know that a full vaccine series still, even in the worst case scenario, if someone were to get sick significantly reduces one's risk of hospitalization. So, in, in big series in the UK. The Pfizer vaccines, a 96% reduction or 96% efficacy against hospitalization, and the AstraZeneca vaccine, 92%. So um, not to say that people can't get COVID-19 if they have a vaccine, and, and we, we recognize that. Um, in uh, the United Kingdom, about 3.4% of the cases were people that were fully vaccinated, uh, and 12 people, unfortunately, did pass away of the Delta variant who were fully vaccinated. In Ontario right now, to date, there are a handful, I believe 12 deaths uh, is since December 2020 to um, uh, May 31st, 2021 of people that were fully vaccinated, 12, one, two. So, you know, there, there are, these vaccines are incredibly effective. We recognize, you know, particularly the person in Foothills was an older individual that was hospitalized for other reasons. 
uh, and even sometimes mild illnesses in people that are fully vaccinated, you know, are, are just too much for their system to take in, in, in some context. So, you know, this is again talking to the point of us being all careful until we all have that type of protection. Um, but recognizing that a full series of vaccine, particularly an mRNA vaccine, has about an 80% protection against the Delta variant. AstraZeneca, about 60%, although again, the hospitalization protection is likely higher and the mixing may actually also be uh, a bit higher than this. Um, you know, there are going to be cases of people that, that uh, get COVID-19 despite being fully vaccinated, but even then, people's risks of hospitalization and death are significantly reduced from it. Thank you, Dr. Tagla. Maybe we'll shift gears a little bit. We've got a question here about supply and access. Uh, Dr. Graywall, Minister Anand, uh, perhaps you could talk to this point. So there, with the recent surge in vaccine supply and changing eligibility frequency, are we expecting more pop-up clinics soon to accommodate accelerated second doses? Uh, I can talk to that uh, a bit. Uh, in Peel Region, uh, you know, you know, with all the announcements in the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, accelerating the second doses, uh, you know, I think it's super important, like uh, like Dr. Chagla said, to get that second dose and not give up and getting that 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 second appointment and and be an advocate for, for your community and and you know, call it SEVA, call it selfless service to get all your community members and your 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 family uh, get those appointments. It's it's super important. Uh, but what's really also important, um, and you know, we're we're actively trying to improve is the improve the accessibility of, of vaccines and getting more vaccines into hot spots uh, because it's so crucially needed uh, to, uh, to be able to to uh, you know uh, to, to get all these appointments uh, you know my, my you know I, as of the announcement today you know there's so many people that are trying to get an appointment and uh, you know I, I think that you are going to see in the, in the weeks to come uh, more employ uh, you know, the, the the first round of the employment led pop-ups are, are going to be doing the second round uh, of the week of June 20th. So you're going to start seeing that next week. Uh, you will see more pop-ups coming up in the Peel region and, and other hot spots in, in, in the province. Um, and uh, with, the, with the amount of, I know also Moderna is coming in uh, and I'm getting, I got a call today about that too. So uh, that hopefully will be coming into the Peel region, uh, Moderna and Pfizer. And so I think we need to make sure that there's there's accessibility for our community, and uh, we need more pop-ups. That is going to happen. It's uh, it's and more. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll see that in the, in the coming weeks. So, great. And Dr. Gray, while you're on the ground there, what would you say is like the number one kind of hesitancy that you've seen in our community, and how and how have you kind of responded to that? Um, the number one hesitancy. I mean, there's uh, you know, there's uh, I, there's there's several, uh, but I think the the, the main is uh, I mean, let me think. Yeah, yeah. While you're while you're thinking, I'm going to prompt your thinking because in our research we ask questions around that, and what we see is the concern about side effects, if we could call them that, not just getting a fever in the first day but the longer term side effects is what we're hearing from the South Asian community. Is that similar to what you've heard? I haven't, I, you know, we, we haven't seen that as much. Uh, they haven't brought that up to our attention. Um, um, you know, in, in, the, in the last couple of weeks, I haven't, but I assume that there, there still is definitely is. And it, there's definitely uh, hesitancy in, in, in certain pockets in, in, uh, for example, there's a, you know, a lumber company down the street here that, that really there's a, you know, significant amount of South Asians that are really hesitant to getting the vaccine. And, and I think that's in the next steps to find out why. Um, and uh, so there still is hesitancy in our communities, in, in our South Asian communities, uh, for a number of reasons. And so I, I still think that we need to continue to research that. And uh, I mean, there's, and that's why we're here today. These town halls are, are for that. Uh, so. Yeah, and from the, the United Kingdom and around the world in kind of a diverse communities, the three factors that seem to come up over and over again is getting information to people. So kind of fact-based information as opposed to misinformation or disinformation, increasing trust in the community. So that is a trust with your family doctor and your bubble of family and friends all kind of motivating you. And the third is access. So I think we, we touched on that, but healthcare access 
Sometimes people prefer going to the family doctor's office for the shot, maybe not as comfortable going to a community center. And what we've also seen uh, is maybe you'll make one attempt to book your vaccine, but if you hit a barrier and you get kicked out of the computer screen, or it says you're booked for uh, October, 2021, that's sometimes too, enough of a barrier that that hesitant person will stop trying to get the vaccine. And we who have booked vaccines for our family members know you have to stay online and keep trying to get your booking. So I think if we look at information, trust and access as potential factors and try and enhance all three areas, we may increase confidence in vaccines. You know, I wonder, Dr. Nand, about also that I, the idea about trust, it's a tricky one because some of the fears we have, we may not feel comfortable admitting them. And, and you know, a big part of my practice is women's health. Um, and so I have definitely had, you know, really great um, appointments with patients and then they'll kind of lower their voice and whisper something to me on the way out the door. And maybe they've heard rumors that a vaccine is going to make it hard for them to have children. Or maybe they've heard that the vaccine is going to interfere with their monthly bleeding cycle. And they're almost embarrassed when they tell me that. And I I, mean, I, I understand, I'm you know, a South Asian woman, I understand that sometimes we don't want to speak freely about this to everybody. Um, those, those fears are not based in science. You can um, have very successful, healthy pregnancies, healthy babies with a COVID vaccine. We want pregnant women to get vaccinated. We know that it doesn't permanently change your monthly blood flow. I think part of that trust is you know, getting over that and understanding that, that you need to have a connection with somebody who you feel is going to really appreciate your worries, even if you're a little embarrassed to talk about them. Great. Okay. I, I guess the other question that we have here that I know a lot of people are wondering is uh, the idea that the time for the second dose of AstraZeneca was reduced from 12 weeks to eight weeks in less than 15 days. And so someone says, I was curious if there's enough evidence to support this accelerated second dose for optimum vaccine efficacy. I, I was one of the people who was very interested in getting that dose, that window lowered to eight weeks. You know, we're kind of in a race against the Delta variant, trying to get second doses out. Uh, my, my take on this and be happy to hear from my co-panelists, but you know, even though COVID's new, we know a lot about the immune system. We know a lot about those blood cells. And what we know is that the trials did look at 12 weeks for AstraZeneca, but we know again from you know, hundreds of years of vaccine science and immunology that, um, that it's actually very effective to wait for eight weeks for a prime and then boost that dose um, at the eight week mark. I mean, maybe if you get a shot and then you try to boost it after two weeks, there may not be anything to boost. But again, based on our experience in vaccine science. Eight weeks is, is safe. It's acceptable. Canada's vaccine experts supported it. And so does, you know, all that, all that history and all that knowledge. Um, Zane, I'm not sure how, what your take is on this because you're seeing the immune system in action in infectious disease. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, the immune system is complex and, and it, it responds and, it, you know, again, that memory response is what we want in the long term, right? So not that first response, but that consolidated second response. When they did the AstraZeneca trial, they looked back and they said maybe 12 weeks is better because they saw, you know, they gave different doses and they gave uh, different intervals. And they kind of looked at it again and say, okay, 12 weeks might be the best here. But we've got data from a large clinical trial in the United States at four weeks of AstraZeneca still showing about 76% protection. So, you know, again, these numbers are, uh, are um, you know, there's, there's a difference between optimal and, and, uh, and perfect and, uh, and what's now. And again, you know, much of this was prior to the Delta variant where, you know, needing much more immunity urgently is probably better in the, uh, in the short and long term to deal with this. And I think the third part, and, and as we talked about earlier in the call, you know, we are going to, this is not the last vaccine likely people will get. This is probably just the first series of vaccines, the ones that keep them out of hospital, the ones that get us back to normal, not necessarily the ones that get us to optimal immunity so that this becomes much less of a pathogen long term. Um, and so, you know, again, people will get their boosting down the line with other, other vaccines, uh, variants, but also to boost their native response. 
Uh, and so again, you know, getting uh, what, you know, permanent immunity you can get now is, is probably way more important than worrying about one or two weeks in one direction or another. Thank you for that. We've got we've got another question about the immune system in action. Um, so many are concerned about taking the COVID vaccine after having an adverse reaction to the flu vaccine in the past. Uh, can you comment on that, Dr. Jaglan, what you would tell uh, somebody in that boat? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Dr. Pai taught me a term today, which I, I, I love. You know, we talk about side effects, but they're really immune effects, right? So when we see Similar to when we see influenza uh, normally or COVID-19 normally, our body takes time to develop antibodies and that process causes inflammation. It causes our, 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 our body's immune cells to start secreting proteins and other compounds that make us sometimes feel a little bit off, make our muscles ache, make the site of injection hurt, sometimes even give us a fever or, or really make us out, you know, a, a bit lethargic for a day. Um, and that's our immune system working, right? You know, the, the, the whole point of vaccination is to train your immune system how to deal with the infection before you have to see the infection rather than when you see the infection in that sense. And sometimes that, that ramp up to getting to that point leads to some of those side effects because our immune system is training. That's what it's supposed to do. And so, you know, and, you know, a lot of people have had adverse reactions to the flu shot. That really, a lot of those reactions are their immune system ramping up to that flu shot to, to actually, again, trick their body as if they had the flu, a very, you know, again, you know, getting those antibodies, getting those cells primed. And then, so when you see the flu, you know, your body's ready to go and you often don't even know if it happened. Um, uh, and so, you know, similar, you know, there, there may be some of these side effects with the COVID-19 vaccine, but these are good. These are your immune system working, right? Yes, they don't feel good that day. And it's a good idea if you can to, to book a day off to, or not do anything strenuous the next day, uh, uh, you know, afterwards if you can. But you would rather have these immune side effects getting your immune system working so that when you see COVID-19, it's trained to do what it's supposed to do as compared to not having your immune system working, having your body learn everything again, and getting the real effects from COVID-19, which can be, you know, sore, sore body, muscle aches, fatigue, but unfortunately, some of the more severe side effects from COVID-19 in terms of hospitalization and death. And so, you know, again, I, you know, people call them side effects and adverse reactions, but many of them are just immune effects. Uh, and again, they're expected and what we want our bodies to be doing to these vaccines as compared to not. I wish we had a vaccine that didn't do this. Um, but uh, but again, you know, our bodies are, are trained mechanisms on how to deal with things. Uh, and so, you know, having the immune system activate, unfortunately, does cause some side effects. But that's what we want at the end of the day. Maybe I'll also point out, um, though, I, I gave my husband the same lecture, Dr. Shagla, and then he got his first shot and he felt totally fine the next day. And I got urgent calls that, oh my gosh, is the vaccine not working? <laughs> Did something go wrong? So, you know, yes, immune effects are great. Our, our body's amazing. Um, but listen, some of you are really tough and your, your immune systems, they do that training fight and you still feel fine. So don't worry if you have a really good day, just enjoy your day off. It doesn't mean that the vaccine didn't work. We're, we're all a little bit different. Our body's blood cells differ from person to person. Okay, great. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Anand, did you want to say something? I was just going to say, I think there's a question uh, for the minister before she has to go to her next call on Novavax and the potential approval of that. Well, thank you. Um, this good conversation has been so interesting. So uh, it's a real joy to be here tonight. On Novavax, I will take you back to last summer when we were putting in place our vaccine portfolio. And we took our advice in procurement from the vaccine task force. And that task force was comprised of experts in industry and in medicine, as you know, and they provided a list of the suppliers, first tier and second tier, that we should be negotiating with and contracting with. And Novavax was one of those seven suppliers on the first tier. 
And so my instruction to the department was we got to execute these contracts ASAP, like let's go. And uh, we, we did sign with Novavax on August 27th. 2020, we purchased 52 million doses of Novavax, and we have options on an additional 24 million doses of uh, that vaccine. Now, the, the thing I do every day, as I was saying, is I talk to these vaccine companies, and we have been working with Novavax and monitoring their um, application to Health Canada. So at the current time, Novavax has an application. It's a, in roll, what's called rolling review. Um, and so it is continually sending information to Health Canada relating to its um, clinical trials. Uh, recently, uh, there were results that were reported from Novavax clinical trials of um, being about 90, 89.3% efficacy in their UK phase three clinical trials. So this is very positive, uh, but it does not at this point get us closer to Health Canada approval. There's still uh, additional data that's coming in from Novavax. And as a general matter, Novavax is also uh, working to shore up its raw materials for mass production of the vaccine. So even when there is Health Canada approval, what we have learned is that the vaccine manufacturers still need to ramp up their production. It is uh, one phase. It is a necessary phase of vaccine procurement to have Health Canada approval. But you'll remember in January and February when Pfizer said to Canada that it was going to delay shipments for some of its doses. And the reason for that was it was retooling its purse Belgium facility in order to ramp up to much higher levels of production and, and therefore supply a greater number of countries uh, with more vaccine. Um, and that has taught us that we have to watch the supply chain very carefully and such is the case with Novavax. Okay, so we're hoping that they'll have Health Canada approval, of course, uh, but the reality is, is that we are now an mRNA country. We are a country that is focused on Moderna and Pfizer. And by the time we are going to be having Moderna Health Canada approved and massive uh, vaccines of that supplier in the country, we're going to have a vast um, number of people already double vaxxed. Uh, so the key is going to be what we would do with Novavax in a next round of inoculations. And uh, so we're definitely still working with the supplier. We have, as I said, a very strong procurement, um, but it's, uh, it's a matter of really timing in terms of when the supply will be ready for Canada and then what we will end up doing with it. Thank you, Minister Anand. Um, we'll take one last question, um, and it is around whether the vaccines can prevent and protect against long COVID symptoms. Uh, Dr. Anand, did you want to take this one, please? Sure. Uh, so short answer, yes. Uh, and I'll maybe take a moment to define what is long COVID. And long COVID are those symptoms uh, of fatigue uh, and brain fog, as well as um, some uh, mental health problems, such as depression and sometimes anxiety, that can persist after someone has had a COVID infection, but not COVID vaccine. So that's the key difference. And long COVID started, it's an intriguing story, by patients who had these long carryover symptoms going onto social media and sharing their experiences. And uh, it is a syndrome. It's similar in many aspects to what used to be called chronic fatigue syndrome. And it's the subject of a lot of research right now. We're hoping to start uh, a study as soon as uh, the grant results come out, where we try and understand what are the cardiovascular and, and brain effects of long COVID. Uh, so we need to learn a lot more, but long COVID occurs after an infection, not the vaccine. I, I, I probably will just add to that. I think, um, 
uh, you know, we, we tend to see long COVID in people that have had moderate to severe illnesses more than, than mild illnesses. And so, you know, again, vaccination, um, uh, you know, those breakthrough cases that often happen with vaccination tend to be the milder cases. So we do think that even if you do, uh, if you do get COVID-19 through a vaccine, sorry, uh, breakthrough from, uh, after being vaccinated, the likelihood of developing long COVID likely does go down in that population as they don't develop the severe complications uh, or even moderate complications of COVID-19. And there is actually some really interesting research ongoing about whether or not um, vaccines can actually, for those who are suffering with long COVID symptoms, actually reverse some of that. It's a really early but preliminary study suggesting, yes, about a quarter of people with persistent long COVID symptoms may actually improve after getting vaccinated. Uh, and it really does speak to some of our um, uh, you know, questions about the immunology and the, the pathophysiology of, of the disease long COVID and, and whether or not that vaccines actually trigger a response to get rid of it. So another good reason to get vaccinated, not only to prevent this complication, um, but if you are you know, suffering from some of those symptoms after your COVID infection, again, it may be a good reason to, to access your vaccine as, as we have certainly seen people have a reversal of the symptoms after being vaccinated. Thank you so much. In the interest of time, we will unfortunately have to wrap up, but we do have a record of all of the questions that were posted in the chat. So we will make a valiant effort to try to address those and communicate uh, with everybody after this session is over. Um, so thank you so much for your thoughtful questions, queries, and participation and engagement in this town hall. A uh, special thank you to Dr. Dubé and Minister Anand, and of course, to our panelists, uh, Dr. Anand, Drs. Anand, Chagla, Pai, and Graywall. Um, it's been such a pleasure to moderate this session, and we will certainly follow up with everybody via email with a short uh, resource package in the end. So uh, thank you. And thank you, Sujani. Thank you, Janiel, for your excellent moder moderating of tonight. Uh, our whole team at the PHRI, McMaster, and our panelists, of course, Dr. Bube, my dear sister, and all of you here on the webinar. We know that you're working hard in your own circles to transmit information about COVID to help your family, to help your community, and we're so ever grateful. And we hope we can do this again with the good news next webinar when we're all double vaxxed. So thanks again to everybody and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Vedasta. Bye, bye, Dr. Dubé. And Minister. You're muted. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll have our debrief tomorrow maybe. But thanks, Zane. I really appreciate it. No problem. It was fun. It was a really good conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we've learned something. And Danielle, you're going to try and go with Dr. Graywell to the lumber yard. Yeah. <laughs> Take care, guys. All right. Good, good job, guys. Yeah, great job. Thank you. How did you feel, Tijani and Jane? Good job. Thank you. Uh, it was good. I think, yeah. If the time went by so quickly. I know. I was going to say we're going to have to hold another one to address all of the other questions in the chat. Yeah.
good questions, good discussion. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Well, a mix of things, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can tell them I thought it was great. It's good. Celine says it was great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, you know, we reached 99 at one point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that saw was that. Good. We almost crossed 100, but 99 is pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll do our curating. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. It's good. Great, great nice. job. No worries. Okay. Johnny, can you just check one thing? I'm going to share. Do you see anything right now? Yeah, yeah. I see the poll results. The poll. Um, you can download it. I downloaded it. I downloaded okay, it. perfect. See, yeah. that, these are really good. Mm -hmm. Like the, the yes percentage to question one is, is higher than that. So interestingly, I don't see any responses on my end. So I was always confused if people were answering or not, but I'm glad they are. They're there, they're there. Okay, okay. Can you, can you see them now? Like the percentages? No, but I downloaded it. I can see them. Oh. Downloaded. Okay, that's good. Yeah. I can, they're showing up on mine. Okay, good. Very interesting, the question five. The mm -hmm. barriers, okay? Booking appointments is featuring prominent the time off work. So this will be great to discuss tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right. Well, thanks again, guys. Good. Have See a good you. night. Thank good. You. Bye. Good night, guys. Great work. Bye. Bye.